All right, guys. Uh, this is Devin with Hillbilly Networks again. I'm going to show you how to get your buffer tubes into your trays in a uh, slice can closure. It's called cans if you work with them a lot. Uh, okay. So now we have all our buffer tubes laid out. They're pretty uh, laid out. They're pretty separated. Um, fully separated all of them. But basically, at this point, you're going to take. I'm going to do four pair um, per tray. So I'm going to do four tubes per tray. So I'm going to take these four. Um, which there's a color code order is fiber. Um, it's blue, orange, green, brown, slate, white, red, black, yellow, violet, rose, aqua. Um, and that just repeats over and over and over uh, in most cases. Uh, there is some other colors and maybe one or two other cables and sometimes you have a stripe. Uh, anyway, I'm going to pretend this tray is mounted in here and I'm going to measure to where the tube, if I'm laying this out, I'm curling this around one loop in the basket and then lay the tubes on top of the tray here like that and I'm going to mark with a permanent marker right where the tubes say stop right here if I were to cut the tubes right there. And I'm going to take that cable out. I'm going to pull it this way. Those same permanent marker marks, if you want to make things a whole lot easier on yourself, just hold all your cables out. Just make those same permanent marker marks in the same areas. Now you know you, where you need to cut all your cables. You go ahead and take your, I'm going to take my black, slate, white, and red. Do the same thing. And go ahead and be perfect. It doesn't have to measure exact. Nothing says you have to do that. You actually probably measure, if you measure it perfect, it's still not going to look perfect. Uh, but. Again, I'm just going to pull these all out here. I'm going to go ahead and make those same marks on these. I will say if you measure close though, make sure these lines line up pretty close, you're going to have a whole lot neater looking closure. So we can just willy nilly put them in there. Okay. And there's a couple of different ways you can do this, a couple of different orders you can do this in. And there's many different types of, uh, I'm going to show you two different types of buffer tube, ways to cut the buffer tube off. One is three hole stripper. It's three hole, the very top hole, the biggest hole. You can actually plant that right over, squeeze, boom, buffer tube comes off. That's what I prefer because it's very fast. You can be a little bit more careful. Can use this little tool made by Ideal, and it's a buffer tube stripper. You make a little ring cut. Some say you're not supposed to bend because you can break the fiber. I've done it a million times, never broke the fiber. Not, so I bend in a little. Don't bend like really hard though. Probably not a good idea. Maybe that's why some people break it doing it. I'm not sure. Okay, so that's how you strip away. So now I can turn around and I can go, I can just start cutting, or stripping each of these fibers in the same place. Fiber button tubes. separated these enough you can turn around and just take them and pull on them all of them and these are just a bunch of empty tubes now. Those go in the trash now. 
gonna do the same thing with all these. So I'm gonna go ahead and get them all broken out. Every single last one of them. Every one. Breaking everybody out. Again, measurements don't have to be perfect, so where your cut doesn't have to be perfect either. Just try to stay close to the front of the parking works. Really close. I'll tell you the part that sucks the most. Say you're doing this with these style strippers and you don't realize that you nicked a fiber. did it and you're splicing a bunch you've got everything done and you get to the end and it's like oh crap a bunch of fibers just start breaking uh, that's because you make them whenever you're stripping them which can happen it doesn't happen much if you're careful but can definitely can happen okay i'm going to take all eight of these and just them over here and don't step on it if it's gel fiber, don't let it land in the floor like this. Uh, I mean, preferably, probably don't let it land in the floor at all. Would be a good idea, um, if we're being honest. Uh, but, anyways, just don't step on it. But if it's gel, it's gonna pick up every little piece of dirt. But I'll show you. Fiber does not like to cooperate much, so you can. Spin it around and it'll turn around and just fall right back off at the time. Because it has memory, the tubes and the. And this is what's scary. You turn around and look over here and you see a piece of fiber just laying there. And you're like, oh crap. Um, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Probably the end. The answer to that. Just remember I said there's a portion at the end that we cut into earlier that is probably where that came from. We hope. Snip. Snip. Be careful, fiber loves to get wrapped around those and you go pull the cable and it breaks it in half. It's like I said, fiber does not do what you want it to do. It loves to get caught on things, loves to go the direction you want it to. Um, it's very panicky, very annoying. But you make a lot of money. many things that make a lot of money that are easy in life. Alright. Okay. I'm going to show you something else now. Inside each of these buffer tubes here. I have something I want to cut off. More strings. The way you're going to tell the difference between these strings and the fiber is it's rigid. You can feel the roughness of the cotton or probably Kevlar. Just go ahead and snip that off. Just like the fiber, it's very annoying. It gets stuck to everything. It'll stick to your boots, stick to your floor, and you'll be dragging a bunch of strings around. So, what I like to do is cut all four. This is one in each two. Unless it's gel, in which case that sucks. I'd rather have a string. And you can just peel those away carefully. 
Sometimes they will get caught on the fiber and break it. All right, now all four of those are ready to go on the tray. But we'll go ahead and cut the ones off the other four of the same color. Because I'm doing what's called a butt splice here. Um, that means you're splicing color to color. So blue tube to blue tube, blue fiber to blue fiber. All the way through. All day. Every day. considering starting your own fiber business that's a great idea uh, but if you're considering learning how to do fiber just to be a splicer and you think I'm gonna make a crap load of money um, yeah that could be the case uh, you'll probably never see your family because those guys that make a lot of money splicing are traveling around the country uh, doing stuff uh, so if you have family I would recommend that um, that's the thing though, if you own a fiber slicing business and you own it, you can, you're the guy at the top, you, know, you can hang out at home a lot of the time, you know, in your home area, you're still going to have to go out and oversee stuff, uh, but everything's very, 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 very expensive, so you're going to take out a lot of money. But the point I'm making is, fiber splicers don't make as much money as what people think they make. Uh, it's advertised as having a lot of money. If you look at the rate of pay per splice, that is a lot of money. You're talking, say, $38 a splice, and there's 144 splices here, 38 times 144, yeah, that's a lot of money. That's a, that's a whole lot of money. Um, you're talking probably $7,000 maybe, I'm just guessing. Um, that's the thing, though. You don't get that unless it's just you talking you might get half that or if you're a good paid splicer so maybe you get 15 maybe you get 20 per splice and you walk home with a couple thousand bucks in your pocket yeah that's great but most i talk to aren't getting paid per splice themselves uh, they're getting paid an hourly rate and it's not that much uh, in comparison to other things like because that tends to be a common misconception, you know, I've seen as people think that there's so much more money in fiber splicing. Well, I work for a power company and I can personally tell you I don't know any splicers that make even half of what uh, linemen make. So, if you like climbing poles and like doing stuff, the money's in the line work. And if you're for a power company, you know, you get to stay in your area. So, there's that too. Unless there's storms or whatnot, then you're gonna have to travel. But usually that's occasional. It's not all the time. Just a little food for thought. If it's something you're considering as a career. But I will tell you, if you're considering planning on starting a business, fiber splicing business, do it now. Don't wait. Everybody's trying to start one right now. And most of them already have a lot of the contracts, and most people starting now are. Only work that's out there is the work that's already divvied out to somebody else that's been working for a company for a while. So that's a. Uh, Get in there quick if that's what you're planning on doing. Now, I will say you go to a bigger area. Yeah, yeah, there's a ton of work. I'm sure you will have no issues. But a lot of, a lot of people don't tell you, though, is you go to big areas, big cities, you have to pay a lot of money for permits and stuff like that to uh, to be able to do work. Sometimes just across the street. 
I literally mean to cross the street with your fiber trailer and go to the other side of the road and do work on the other side of the road, you got to go down to City Hall or whatever and get a permit. Kind of ridiculous. But, and that permit costs money. You got to have a flag to prove. That also costs money. Um, so, when somebody tells you, you know, oh, I cleared, you know, we cleared, my company made 200000 this month in Nashville. They didn't really make 200000 They made a lot less than that after paying all those um, fees out. It's, uh, like I said, common misconception. Yes, there's a lot of money in it, but only if you're looking at it from the right angle. If you're the owner, eventually there's a lot of money in it. You're talking about a lot of very expensive upfront costs. To get a good splicer, like a Fujikura, AFL, uh, Patel, you're talking thousands of dollars. Uh, the splicer I'm working with today is an $11,000 splicer. Uh, so, should give you an idea of how expensive equipment is. This trailer, that's a lot of money. Gas, regenerator, a lot, a lot of, a lot of costs involved. Um, and then when you get into the side of running lines and running, you know, because most places aren't just going to hire you to just splice something. They want you to run that line. They want you to dig, bury, bore. They want you to do it all. And having a boring machine line trucks, I mean those are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and then finding people that you can trust to operate that equipment. Uh, that's another story because somebody operating a boring rig that don't know what they're doing um, could cost you a lot of money um, or get somebody severely hurt. Um, same thing goes for a bucket truck. Fortunately, when you're doing that kind of work, the fiber itself might not be that dangerous, but everything you're around, put it, install it, and get it around is very dangerous. We've got power 36 to 48 inches underground, and it's about 10 foot or so from the comms lines usually. Um, so, on the aerial. And again, somebody don't know what they're doing, they could accidentally get lit up or get somebody else lit up. So on that one, let's say for underground, always but let's call 811. It's free. We have people hit our lines all the time, it seems like. Not literally all the time, but in the years I've been here I've seen it happen several times. That they always want to try to play dumb, like, oh, I had no idea. Well, yeah, you did. You just didn't want to call 811. And when you're the owner of that fiber, you're in a very unique position at that point. You've got two options. You legally can charge that person whatever amount it's going to cost you to repair it or you can eat the cost. And you're thinking, why the heck would you eat the cost? Um, the reason you would eat the cost is because the amount of money that you're talking about charging somebody for that work to redo that will bankrupt many, many companies. Um, I, I've personally seen many instances where people have done it and my company has not charged them because we knew full and well that they're going out of business if we charge them for that. Because and the reason I mention that is if you ever know somebody that hit a line and they're talking about it and they're talking trash, just remember there's some company that probably could have bankrupted them for what they did. And it's not very smart as a business owner to not bud because when you hit a line like that, you're risking your entire business. And if you don't realize that, it's probably not the business you need to be in talk to several people that don't realize that and they want to argue and get get nasty with you when you're trying to be nice and not charge them whenever they're the ones that didn't call the button and 
To me, that is very, very, very not sure. But actually, I think of one specific instance where a guy, uh, when he comes to mind, he was uh, doing some landscaping on a yard and clearing off a yard and uh, didn't call it in and uh, hit our line. That guy, first thing he did was try to say, you know, well, our line's not very deep enough, this, that, and the other. Well, you know, our line was actually a uh, trench deeper than most telecommunications lines. Uh, if he didn't know that, he hadn't been doing it very long. And uh, the law does not say that you have to bury a telecommunications line, at least in the state of Kentucky, uh, as deep as you do, say, power or something like that. So there's a lot of leeway there. You want to get it beneath the permafrost, but I know a lot of companies that literally just put it two or three inches in the ground. We do not. We generally put it 48 inches in the ground, just like our power. But most places do not do that. And that fella, you know, we could have charged him and bankrupted him. Not a thing he could have done about it. Uh, but even though he mouthed off, we still gave him the benefit of the doubt, and we we ate the cost of the repair. Um, but I didn't get to talk to that guy directly, but I made sure and tell, told the owner of the land that that guy needs to be aware that if he does that again, he ain't gonna have no landscaping business anymore. To me, that's it's just kind of sad. You know, like I said, you know, you're trying to help somebody out, and the first thing they do is want to say, you know, this is your fault. And they know full and well, but you know, people do that because they're trying to cover themselves. You know, so if you ever deal with that, it's because they're scared. They are scared. They're going to lose their business. They are in fear. They are very stressed out, and they're worried that they're about to lose everything. So they're doing everything they can blame placing to try to get themselves out of that when it ain't gonna get them out of it. You didn't call 811 dick, your ass, your S-O-L. I don't care if the telephone company buried it two inches under ground. You didn't call 811, you're gonna have a hard case you know, to argue there. Yeah, maybe you might, you, know, you might get away with it because it was two to three inches, maybe. Um, maybe, but again, you know, that judge, you know, when you're in that civil case, you may ask, like, don't you, you called 811 before, why didn't you call it that day? And he could side with him, so it's, it's not worth the risk, just call. A lot of times, people don't want to call because it takes time, I don't know, I'll tell you that. You're in a rush to do the work. They've got deadlines, but for like fiber optic line, you're, and you are talking the house, sometimes twenty, forty, thirty thousand dollars more, depending on the line, for one little cut. Because I mean, I told you this is a five thousand dollar build right here. Um, depending on the payout, you know. Could be a seven thousand dollar bill just for this closure. So imagine if it's underground and they had to rebore, they had to reconnect pipes, you know, dig up, use a backhoe to fix it, you know, to get everything up and then reconnect and then rerun the fiber. That's a lot of added cost. That's a lot of added labor because um, a lot of those companies are charging by the foot for that work, for everything. They're charging by the foot for the pipe. They're charging by the foot for the fiber. Time. So, I mean, it adds up to thousands and thousands of dollars. So, you know, just call. Save, save you or your company lots of money. All right. You know what? I want to put more. I'm not ready to put these in the trays yet, but. 
Uh, what I didn't tell you earlier, um, I've been cutting this little, uh, Velcro material. We cut little pieces of that off. And, and I'm sorry, I did not tell you why. Uh, sometimes I'm used to doing things and what I'm doing here, the Velcro is. It's a little piece of Velcro. It's just the soft side, it's not the rough side. Um, it's actually designed to wrap around these buffer tubes and these trays. I'll show you in a minute. We're going to put zip ties through here. I call them baby zips. We're going to put the baby zips through here and then the buffer tube will have this wrapped around it to offer a, uh, a bit of protection for whenever you pull that zip tie tight, it's not choking the tube directly. And also um, gives a kind of anchoring points uh, a tension relief where it's uh, making it harder to pull that cable out of the tray pull that buffer tube out so I'm just cutting these off in like little half inch cuts they don't have to be big just big enough to wrap around once so I've got eight more tubes here so I need Again, don't have to be perfect, just enough to wrap around. A little goes a long way. Right, so now I'm going to take each of these. I'll show you as many tricks as I can. Instinct makes you want to grab the paper and like flick it like that. Grab the cloth in the corner with your nail, the cloth part of it. You peel up from that side, it's a whole lot easier. Getting hungry. A lot of this stuff, and you know, as I've said several times, you have multiple people, um, it makes a lot of this stuff a whole lot faster. When you're one singular person doing this, it feels like it takes forever to do the smallest thing like putting Velcro on it. Um, and it does, I swear, it takes forever. Um, normally, we'll show you what you do if you have multiple people. You take these, you have a guy over here peeling these off. He'd just be sticking these on the edge of the counter here. And the main guy is going to have helpers, a splicer. Uh, he's just going to take these. And you're probably going to have two other people one other person doing the same thing on the other two to have the same time. Makes it a whole lot faster. Sometimes you even have two splicers at one location. Splice the two different trays at the same time. Once you, you know, after you've been doing for a while, you learn how to do stuff like that. Like, I'm going to show you in this video how I was taught. Um, actually, pretty recently. Um, like I said, I'm a network analyst. I don't just do splicing. So, I'm not a splicing expert. I have been to two splicing schools, and I am, you know, certified as a telecommunications engineer, 
or register communications designer, we call it that. Uh, I did a video on that. But um, anyways, uh, the way I did that is I measured out to get to the tray. And the neat thing about that is after you measure the first one, you cut them all to the same length. Um, you don't have to put your trays in here to be able to anchor them in and do your splicing and stuff. Um, you can actually set your trays out over here. And the benefit to that is when you go to splice, you can just stack up all three trays over here. Put your splicer right here. So I've got a really cool little splice kit thingy, um, whatever, and you can just drape them all across and sit here and just go to town on it all day long. Okay, so now I'm going to take the first four of each, and I want to make sure these suckers ain't tangled up here. We'll separate them so they come apart like that. I'm going to go ahead and start anchoring stuff to trays here in just a second. Now, like I said, fiber loves to tangle. So that's what it's doing over here. Y'all can't see it, but it's doing it like crazy. Alright, it's untangled. Quit. Okay, so now I'm going to take my baby zips. So just open the whole bag. Probably come with like a hundred count, I guess. I don't know. I didn't read the bag. Hundred, yeah. Hundred count. I'll tell you what they are. Made by Terminal Supply Company since 1966. Four inch length, three fourths inch max. Eighteen pound tensile strength. Point one. Okay, so I bundled them together so they don't go all over the place. You use one zip tie in the middle. I'm going to do that. You're going to need eight for each tray if you're doing four tubes. I'm not really counting here, but show you what I do to make things fast. The way to make things faster with this, and I am moving really slow. I'm not going to lie, um, because I'm trying to make a video. And So normally it'll go faster. But take your trays. Ah. Take the cover off all of them. Set them somewhere. With fiber splicing, this is the fastest way to do it with all of it. Keep all your stuff in the same location. Though. So, put all three of my trays there. That way I'm not spending time looking around for that. Uh, all the same parts in the same location. Okay. So now just go ahead and, like, if you're doing any task, just like this, I opened up all my buffer tubes at the same time. Trimmed off all my strings at the same time. Put on all my Velcro for all my buffer tubes at the same time. Now, for every single tray, I'm put in my zip, all my zip ties for all the trays at the same time. So it's almost like you pick a task, focus on doing that task for all of the trays or devices you're working with. It's like the fat, you know, it gets things in a, in a moving a whole lot faster that way. Because then, because you spend, it's almost like you spend a lot of time bouncing between you waste time when you bounce between tasks. So just, if you pick up a task, just go ahead and complete the whole thing. So in this case, I'm gonna drop in eight zip ties on each side. Here's how I'm doing it. Right now they're just dangling. Just make sure they're facing the same direction, the open end. You see, I can't count. I said eight per tray, 16 per tray. Uh, 
Okay. So now. I'm going to take a zip tie here and fish it up through that little hole there. Pull it tight. You're just going to do that over and over again for all of them. Again, have a second person, third person, whatever, doing this. And then while they're doing that, you could already be anchoring your tubes into your first tray. And then you could be splicing while they're working on the other ones. And then they could be splicing in those tricks if you're splicing in that tree. You can do things super fast when you've got multiple splicers, multiple people, um, but a lot of that is having multiple people that know what they're doing because um, believe it or not, your helpers that are helping you are uh, for things to move fast, they need to know uh, how the splicing uh, they need to know the flow of things if you want things to flow fast for you 